we're ready to go back to another webinar talk show. How are you doing today, Elis? I am doing very well, thank you. It's finally sunny here, so my office looks bright. That's always a good thing. And we have a spectacular guest today. Oh, I am so excited. I've been all excited all week because, you know, the world's kind of a crazy place right now. And sometimes you need somebody who can see both sides and get everybody to step back and take a breath. And I think that's what today's show is going to be all about. It is indeed, and we're going to get right to it because we want all of our time to have this discussion. So it is my privilege to introduce Ome Kongo Dibinga. He is a professor, a performer, and the director of Us Upstander International. Welcome to the webinar talk show, Ome Kongo. Hey, Thank how you, you doing? So much, what's going on? What's going on? I'm excited to be here. Oh, we're excited to have you. I got to tell you, I saw you speak at the Influence Conference last year, and I was just blown away. I sat in the audience going, wow. Well, I received that. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It was such an honor, you know, just to be able to get up there and talk. So I'm glad it was well received. It was indeed. And one of the reasons that we wanted to bring you on the show, because what you talked about then, I think is even more poignant now the finding common ground in uncommon times. These are certainly uncommon times. Yeah, did, did and, you have any idea that the times could get more uncommon than they were <laughs> a few months ago? I thought it would get worse. I didn't think it would get this bad, for sure. <laughs> so in this unpredictable time, so in all honesty, I wanted you to come on the show so you could help me personally. <laughs> 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 and you know that's a that's a privilege we have in, in having a show like this but i live in wisconsin i am also somebody who is high risk for covid-19 and my state just pretty much because of a supreme court decision blew open the doors and things are just now open people i think tom was saying before we got on the air in his state, people are kind of coming down on political sides. Yes. Say a little bit about that, Tom. Yeah, so I, l I live in Texas, and it seems that, uh, as you, and I live in Austin, so we're sort of the blueberry in that strawberry pie. <laughs> and it seems that when you talk to people, their belief on how we reopen has to do with who they vote for rather than the science behind it. And right. Matthew McConaughey has actually come out with uh, uh, public service announcements and things saying, hey, you know, this isn't about who you want to be president. This is about what's happening with a disease. And he lives here in Austin, so he's been all over the local news and somewhat nationally talking about this. So I thought we might touch on a little bit of that today. Yeah, yeah, it, and it's, it's, it's extremely necessary. Look, at, at one of the things I said when, when we had that convention was, the way you show support for your favorite leader, favorite politician is not giving them a clean slate, but by holding them accountable. Mm -hmm. And if we're talking about finding common ground in, in uncommon times, one of the things we have to focus on is looking at leadership and holding them accountable for what you said, for what you say. There was a, a rally of, of truck drivers at the, at the White House a couple of days ago, and several of the truck drivers, they were saying, hey, I love Trump, I voted for him, but I do not feel like he's delivering what we need right now, so we're trying to get his attention. That's holding leadership accountable, whether you love him or not. I just read a story this morning where you have members of the National Guard who were deployed to do work in areas relating to COVID. And after 90 days, they're eligible for their GI Bill benefits. Mm -hmm. They just got cut off at day 89. Oh my God. So they worked in these communities for three months and got cut off from their benefits. And what happens if they contract COVID two weeks from now? Right. And so we know that all of us love our military, have support mm -hmm. for our military. You don't have to be a, a, a Trump fan or a Trump hater to say that we all should be able to come together to make sure that these military uh, women and men who served us di diligently and, and vigorously get the benefits they earned. And that's what finding common ground is, uh, in uncommon times is about, coming down to the basic humanity-focused questions 
to get us moving forward. And that's where I am right now. And that's where I've been mm -hmm. in my work because it's not about shifting people's political views. It's about that common humanity piece that we're missing nowadays. That's really interesting. And I, I think that's been a real challenge during COVID-19 because we see these numbers of people who are hospitalized or dying from COVID-19. And a lot of those numbers, like it, it seems like those deaths have, have become acceptable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. Yeah. it's only this many. Now just, just, just to be clear, it became acceptable at a certain time. See, in the beginning mm -hmm. of this whole thing, there was this notion of we're all in this together. But mm -hmm. quite honestly, after, if you look at the timeline, after the racial data came out, about who was dying the most, primarily black and brown people. It was only after that, that you started seeing the rallies in places like Lansing and other people saying we need to open up because there was this idea of, well, we're not really affected. So huh. let's get out there and do this. And it's an actual traceable timeline, which shows that this whole concept of we're in this together, it's almost like the new uh, post-racial that people said after Obama won. You know, people wanted to just kind of say these fluffy terms, but it's never really been the case. That is uh, chilling. Just chilling. <laughs> <laughs> and well, here's, here's common, common chilling. You know, you got to get to these common base points and it's got to be chilling. If it doesn't jar you, you're not going to want to work to make it change. You know, Lyndon Johnson said that, as president, Lyndon Johnson said that, I learned at a young age that if you can convince the poorest white man that he's better than the best quote unquote colored man, he won't realize you're picking his pocket. Give him someone to look down on and he'll empty his pockets for you. Now, just think about that. After the Civil War, it was poor white people and former enslaved black people who were rebuilding the South together. It was the rich landowners who were threatened by that. And that's when you started to see things like Jim Crow policies come up. You started to see things like Confederate statues get raised because they didn't exist right during the Civil War to draw the poor white people away from the former enslaved people because they didn't want people coming together for that common good. We're seeing a lot of that today. So how do we get people in today's world to come together really and not just have a slogan that they use for whatever side they're on? Yes, I, I think that's a great question. The main question comes down to what do you want for the future? Mm -hmm. What do you want to have for yourself, for your children? And the thing that you want is also the thing that I want. And we also have to kind of bring this kind of NSA mentality to it, right? We say, don't fight over a small piece of the pie, come together and make a bigger pie. So the right. question becomes, you know, how do we work together for this common good? Okay, if there's a sewer line that busts in our community, when the water department comes, sewage department, they're not just gonna come and fix the sewer line for your house. They have to fix it for the entire block. So what you have to start with, what are the basic things that you need and that I need that we can work together on? We also, one of the things we can do, we can all agree that we need that supermarket open. We all need, mm -hmm. we all can agree that that hospital needs to be open. Those little things that have nothing to do with politics but have big consequences, get those conversations going there, putting the politics aside, that's where it starts. It's not easy, but the challenge is, is that the conversation isn't even happening. It isn't even starting. And that's why, you know, Matthew McConaughey is getting so much attention right now because he's trying to put forward a conversation that hasn't even started on a local or national level. This is something that has been running in my head is that I think we romanticize past crises and say, oh, you know, World War II, we pulled together and all the sides were on the same side. I am not a student of history, but I'm willing to bet there were people who opposed what was, what the country was doing in World War II. It, especially, I know certainly at the beginning before Pearl Harbor, there was a lot of resistance for getting involved. Do you think that we're actually more divided politically now than we have been in the past, or is this just showing up in different ways? One of the challenges we have today is that we haven't learned how, or we've forgotten how to embrace critical thinking. 
And then you couple <laughs> that with a, with a school system that doesn't teach things like civics, and you have people working off of uh, their ignorance and being, and being proud about their ignorance, so they don't have to care about particular groups of people. Going back to your World War II example, yeah, I'll give you two quick points on that. Number one, there were Americans holding Nazi rallies in Madison Square Garden. You know, people don't show you those pictures. Another thing, uh, uh, when, they, they, when black people, black soldiers uh, captured Nazi troops in Germany, different places, when they were transferring them to the prisons, the black soldiers rode in the back of the bus and the Nazis were up front. That's how deep the racism penetrated. But those are, like you said, those are the stories that don't get taught. You know, we talk about greatest generation, things get romanticized. And a lot of us are working off of that romanticized idea. Let's bring it back to the way things used to be. I like it when it used to be this, when it was that. Yeah, when people say, you know, uh, the good old days. Well, the good old days for you were the days where probably women couldn't vote. Or the days <laughs> people who look like me couldn't go to school or earn, earn property. Or if you were Irish, you were told don't apply for this job. You know, there would be signs depending on you say no dogs, blacks, Irish or Jewish people allowed. I have a Jewish mm -hmm. friend who she bought her house and on the leash, because they didn't know she was Jewish, it said not to be sold to black or Jewish people. And this was in like the 80s. So you know what I mean? So really? oh absolutely yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that one of the challenges we have to encourage people to read and learn and understand history because if they can see that the cycle is repeating itself, maybe people would feel like they don't wanna be duped by what's being told to them by their favorite leaders. But this lack of knowledge about what's happened before and how we've been here before, that's one of the things that our leaders can use to keep us divided because if you don't know the history, anybody can feed you a narrative. So you bring up critical thinking and yes. I think it's important and I believe, and, and, and maybe I'm just romanticizing this, I believe it was taught in schools in the yeah. 70s. I mean, I like to believe I was taught to look at both sides. I remember yep. having to mm -hmm. learn debate in junior high and That's you had right. to show up prepared to whatever the topic, you know, whether it was right. abortion or prayer in school or whatever was the, the topic of the 70s, you had to be ready to defend either side of that in the debate that you were gonna be doing. And, Am I wrong? That's not really the way we teach kids now. It's, it's not only not the way we teach them anymore, but we also have a society where because of 24 hour cable and our phones and our ability, we, we all have the ability to create our own bubble and just get our ideas reinforced. So you can watch you know, Fox all day and get your ideas reinforced. Watch MSNBC all day, get your, your, your ideas reinforced. And you know, when I encourage my students at American University, I say, watch them all and make your own decision. That's one of the hardest things for them to do, to watch Fox, C-SPAN, MSNBC, and, and, and uh, CNN, and then come up with their own thoughts. And it's transferred over to the adults as well. And then, of course, if you go on YouTube, the algorithm is going to feed you something similar to what you clicked on. So you have to actively do the work to learn about different sides. Otherwise, your ecosphere is going to feed you the same things. And we have become kind of intellectually lazy on a particular level. So we just go by what our favorite leaders say because we entrust them with all their power or our favorite newscaster. And that's we have to go beyond that. We have have to diversify what we read and see and who we talk to. <laughs> right. Well, and that's confirmation bias, right? We're always looking for information that affirms what we believe. And we're uncomfortable when we receive information that is contrary to that. That's right. That's one of the things I said in the speech, you know, we, we go online and news sources looking not for information, but for affirmation. Right. And we we'll never find common ground doing that. So is this something that's true for both sides? I mean, I, I, I tend to see people on the left say, oh, you know, Fox is so agendaed, my news isn't. And then people on the other side say, you know, MSNBC is so agendaed, mine isn't. Is, is it equal? I don't know if it's equal, but it does happen on both sides. I don't, I don't know the ratio or the scale, but it absolutely happens on, on, on every side of the spectrum. So you probably saw the story where um, the woman who was Roe and Roe v. Wade you know, who uh, just died recently, um, she said that she was paid by um, anti-abortion uh, activists to say that she was um, uh, pro-life. And, uh, and she is about to be revealed in a documentary that's about to come out. And one of the things that she said was, 
I felt like I was used by both sides. Mm -hmm. I felt like, you know, the pro-life and the pro-choice people took me when they felt my message was relevant to them and propped me up. So there's exploitation that happens in, in, in every group, in every area. And yeah, it's very easy to point the finger at like a Fox or at like a Trump or so on right. and so forth. But you do that, you almost do that with a certain level of arrogance to think that your own news source can't be biased as well. But if you start to challenge yourself and start reading some diversified things, you might start to say, oh, <laughs> you know, I did not realize that was the case, but that's the work we have to do. I will tell you what I did after I listened to you speak on that stage, uh, I went on Facebook and followed all of my elected officials, most of which are not in the party that I would affiliate with. Mm -hmm. it, so I have followed elected officials in both parties. Yeah. It changed my feed significantly. Yes. And that was challenging mm -hmm. because I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like it at all. Yeah. But I think one of the things that it taught me was when, for example, my state rep posts something and it makes me feel like my head is going to explode because I don't agree with it. I challenge myself to actually read. <laughs> <laughs> not just react to the title or the comment, but read what they're talking about and, and go a little farther and go and look what actually the legislation is and, and that sort of thing. And I have found myself very challenged by that. But I think that's what you are talking about is not sitting in my confirmation bias, <laughs> but yeah actually seeking out contrary information. Yeah, I mean, on Twitter, you know, I mean, I know social media has become mm. more anti-social media nowadays, <laughs> but, you know, I actively look for people to engage. And, you know, some people will just come at me with the ignorance and the racism, but I make it clear. I say, hey, look, I'm not here to fight. I'm here to talk. And if you're interested in having an mm -hmm. honest conversation, let's go. And sometimes I've had like two day conversations, you know, tweeting back and forth between the different hours with people who wanted to have a real conversation. And then, you know, we'll may end up following each other and, you know, thank you. And, and then they also, have, some of them have also thanked me. One of the first things they'll say is like, thanks for not calling me an idiot or, you know, or this or right. that or, and, and how they appreciate that. Like people are looking for that. They're just looking for someone to take the first step. And I have no problem being the person first to try to appeal to somebody's intellect because I'm never going to call them names and I'm let them know that. And I think people are looking for that. But, you know, there's this kind of stick your chest out mentality out there nowadays and they're waiting for someone to be that calming influence. And that's what I try to do in terms of and it helps and it helps in these conversations. And I learn a lot from these conversations, too. So let's talk a little bit about that. People, I think, on all political spectrums and across any division that we could find throughout history tend to call names to the other side, to sort of dehumanize, mm -hmm. depersonalize the yes. other side. So how important is it that we live sort of the way you do and, and don't call people an idiot or dehumanize them, but at least give them that seat at the table? We don't have to agree. Right. How important is that as a step for all of us? It, 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 it's, it's, the base, it's, it's step number one, because if people don't feel like they're being respected at a base level, they are going to shut you down in any way, shape or form, they're gonna do whatever they can say to call you out or shut you down. So one of the things I say to them is, I, you know, if I get a response from somebody, I'll say, you know, I, and I get it from people on all backgrounds, you know, not just, you know, people who may have diet, you know, different uh, political views than me. Some people who are quote unquote, you know, on my side, if they don't like a point, they'll come at me too. And one of the things I say is like, I appreciate you taking the time to share your comments and I would love to continue this. Can we do this in a more respectful manner? And, you know, that just comes back to your home training. And if you don't have that home training and people can't do it, then I say, thank you. I'm moving on to somebody else who will. And I don't waste my time anymore. Right. So, you know, we, we again, people have to see it demonstrated before they want to do it. And when, when they, I know one of the hurricanes hit, I think in New Jersey, you know, uh, mm -hmm. New Jersey governor, then governor Chris Christie got a lot of pro, uh, flack because he was working with then President Obama on the aid. And he was like, yo. I don't care his political affiliation. My constituents need this support, like right. that base level. 
there's time for the attacks afterwards. And they've attacked each other during different times and seasons of campaigning. But the base need, my people need support. But then the question becomes, who do you define as your people? Right? Mm -hmm. you know, we got a stimulus packages that are going out right now where some of the people who might not be documented, but who do a lot to make this country grow in terms of the jobs that they work can't get access to that stimulus money. Is, you know, is that fair? Is that just, you know, do, uh, you know, fine. You may feel like that's fair because they're not uh, American citizens, but, it, but then you can say, well, the next thing we should do is work to create a different fund for them so they can also get their piece of that larger pie that we create as well. Because again, they're working here and they are paying taxes. <laughs> so how do you balance that out? But, it's, but again, even that is a conversation to have. I think one of the things you said at the beginning really still stays with me is that we're not even having the conversation. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's the most frustrating thing is that we've become so entrenched in, in separate ways of thinking that we can't even have that conversation. We can as individuals start doing that but what do you think we can do to encourage our leaders to start having those conversations? I have, who was the Kawasaki said, uh, if, if the people lead, the leaders will follow. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I believe. I believe that if we get more of this going on, more conversations like this going on, um, town halls between different organizations and people, and then the leaders start seeing that they're going to realize that they'll have no choice but to respond if enough young people speak up if the elderly speak up and you know people start to come together like i talked about post reconstruction then the leaders are going to have to respond to that because obviously their number one goal uh for many of them is not service but keeping political power and if they really feel like they can lose that uh by seeing people coming together lead by the leadership done by the people then they will start to change i think just calling them out calling them names that doesn't do much, but they need to see a groundswell of people saying, hey, I'm Republican, I'm Democrat, our hospital needs surgical masks, period, bottom line, because, you know, they don't ask my political party when I check into the emergency room, and you have to, <laughs> or they shouldn't, you know, if they are. They shouldn't, yeah. You know, but it's like, you know, and, 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 you know, you have the power to make that happen, right? So even if you look at, um, for example, with Mitch McConnell, with certain with these stimulus bills, like every time one has come up, he has said he's gonna oppose it, and then he changes his mind and a vote happens for it. That's just one mm -hmm. example because of the groundswell of people who call him from Kentucky, Republican, Democrat, independent, whatever, who say we need this. And that happens mm -hmm. with you know Republican leadership, Democratic leadership, they do respond to the pressure. But I think so many of us are so caught up and live in our own lives that we think that they that we that we're not important enough to reach out to them and that they will respond right. to us. And we have to take that power back as the common person. So Oma Congo, this has been fascinating. And as we sort of wrap this up, one of the things that sort of comes to my mind is COVID is a short term problem, whether it's a few more months or a, God forbid, a year or longer. Eventually, this becomes part of the rearview mirror. So in the work that you do as a speaker, as a professor, as a researcher, and, and the stuff that you do with Upstander International, what message do you have to everybody for this crisis, for coming together, but then maybe a little broader for the world coming together? What, what are you teaching people right now? And what do you hope everybody will hear? Well, one of the things I'm trying, I'm teaching people is that not to accept terminology like the new normal, which is something that I use at, at times. Uh, this will change. You know, I, I flipped the word COVID, C-O-V-I-D, and said, continue on, victory is destined, right? You know, because we are going to get over it. Like, what happens if you just have that idea of continue on, victory is destined, because, you know, we, we've been through things like this before. So, you know, flipping the mindset so that everything we focus around is not negative. I mean, there are stories about a 104 year old man who survived it. And, you know, so many, you know, incredible stories that we can flip it. So, you know, that's one of the things, not taking this mentality that we've already lost. And then, because we've overcome things like this before. And then after that, when this is passed, I am challenging people to do an honest assessment 
of the disparities in terms of who this hit and why. And then I'm going to call them out to call them to action, I should say, what are you willing to do to make sure this never happens again? Are you willing to jump into the medical field? Are you willing to help fight to change laws? Are you willing to become, you know, a, a teacher to teach people about social justice? Are you willing to, you know, be someone next time this happens that's gonna, you know, drive meals to people who need it? You know, my philosophy is that everybody can do something, but we have to make sure that what happens now is not forgotten so we can learn the lessons. There's a documentary out about the flu from 1918, and we're seeing a lot of the mistakes repeated from then right now as it relates to how we're opening up. But how many people have seen a documentary or know about that? You know, they're too right. busy calling it the Spanish flu, don't even realize that it started in Kansas. But you know, <laughs> that's just, you can't even go that far with people. So that's what I think. Okay, we learned this. What are we gonna do going forward to make sure that the disparities that hit all these communities don't happen again. I have a role as an educator. You can have somebody a role as a medical person. You can have a role as a politician, we, as a religious person, as clergy. We all have a role to play if we're really all in this together. So if somebody wanted to bring you to talk to their organization, to inspire their people, where would they find you? They can find me on upstanderinternational.com, upstanderinternational.com. They could also reach out to me in the social platforms, um, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram. You can just type in my name, Ome Congo, and, and everything they need will be uh, found right there. And I, I would love to get out there and do some work with them. Well, thank you so much for coming and sharing. I, I find the, the every time I've seen you speak over the years, I'm always so compelled to just be better. So thank you for coming and sharing with us here on the webinar talk show. Thanks for having me, I appreciate it. Uh, Eliz, I, I think this is one of those examples of why we believe that an interview can be better than a talking head over PowerPoint. I mean, I think that these conversations that we're having with people like Ome Congo, I, I think they're touching people who are watching these videos. I believe that's true. And I don't think you get there in a virtual environment or a hybrid environment just talking head over PowerPoint. You need to have that engaged conversation to bring things to be very valuable to the participant. Who's, and coincidentally, who's that's what we do. Coincidentally. <laughs> and if you have an association or organization who would benefit to have this sort of environment for the information you want to make sure the participants engage with, you can find us at webinartalkshow.com, or you can find us on Facebook at Webinar Talk Show. We have more fun, wonderful, engaging. I don't know how we're going to top Mekongo. But we always do. We'll be fine. But we, we, we'll keep working for you to bring you really amazing people to have great conversations. We'll see you next, not next Monday, because it's Memorial Day, but next Wednesday with a new episode. Thanks for joining us. And thank you again, Omekongo. Such a delight to have you here. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Take care.